<laughs> good. Okay, we're live. I think we're getting close. Hey, Mark. And hey, hey, Paul. Good to see, see you. Mark in a while. Yeah. Those who haven't seen Mark and um, Anton met with um, Tri Healthy Tri County and did a great presentation to the. Uh, um, they did a great presentation uh, for the uh, business on the uh, Healthy Tri-County program. Y'all did a really a good job. It's on YouTube. And it's, I think I passed it out, but it's really a, a good opportunity. Out. Thank you. All right. I think we are back. We are live now. So um, I will turn it over to you, Dan, and I'm going to pull up the agenda. Yeah, thank, thank you, Paul. So my name is uh, Dan Bornstein. I'm sitting in for uh, Anton Gunn to chair uh, this meeting of the City of Charleston Health and Wellness Advisory Committee. Today is Wednesday, October 7th, and we've got a pretty full agenda today. I know that uh, typically uh, Anton likes to take us through a, a fun, reflective exercise, um, but in the interest of, of keeping that uh, his little thing, and in the interest of keeping us on, on track for our full agenda, uh, I, I'd like to move through the agenda, and, and Paul, if you wouldn't mind maybe taking taking the roll, uh, and we do have some special guests with us today as the, uh, the second item on our agenda is a uh, results of a study that's been done through a, a group that's uh, represented here today. Okay, let me, in the meantime, I'm going to make Morgan, a co-host, so that she'll be ready to go with her presentation. Um, okay. We have on the on the um, call today, or in our Zoom, we have um, our guest, uh, Morgan Huey, Dr. Huey of the College of Charleston, uh, Dan Bornstein with representing the Citadel. Kevin Sheely is one of our city council members. Mark Dixon represents the um, Roper St. Francis. Uh, Go is representing the College of Charleston and does our uh, adolescence um, um, area group. Um, Demetria Mikalaka, something of that name, uh, very close is with the civil joining us as with the group that's, that's in the presentation. Uh, Jeff Davis is with that group. Um, Jennifer Roberts is, represents mental health with the Charleston Dorchester uh, Mental Health um, Department. Did I get it right? Um, Jeremy Collins is a guest with uh, Tri Can um, with um, Healthy People, Healthy Carolinas, and the Healthy um, Tri County program from Tri to United Way. Um, uh, Katie, Dr. Katie Richardson is representing uh, DHEC um, with us. Um, I mentioned Mark and Meredith uh, um, Merlinski also is joining us from the um, Roper St. Francis Hospital. Uh, we have a guest, Dr. Robert Ball from MUSC. Uh, the uh, infectious control is, is um, I probably didn't say that right, but Robert's joining us. Then we have Susan Johnson from MUSC who represents our built environment. And we have a special guest, Tracy McKee, who will give us an update on the cities, um, where we are with the health program with the city. And I believe the iPhone, is that, Jan, are you the one on the iPhone? I think Jan Park was joining us, but I'm not sure who the who's on the iPhone today. It's Joyce Green with Fetter. Oh, Joyce Green. Joyce, welcome. Um, we're glad to have you. And I'm not sure. I think the mayor was supposed to join in and seekings at some point. So as they come in, we will uh, welcome them. And at this time, the, the mayor is just coming on. So um, I'll let him get into the chat. Um, mayor, we welcome you. We're getting ready to 
Dan Bornstein is our chair today, so we'll um, introduce him. Dan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, welcome, everybody. I, I really appreciate everybody taking time uh, to the standing committee members. Uh, thank, thanks for continuing to help us navigate uh, the, these challenges that we have. Uh, and to those of you who are special guests, I welcome you as well. It is a very unique time, and our, our, our agenda reflects both the challenges of meeting some of the most immediate public health needs, obviously related to COVID-19, uh, and then also the challenges associated with continuing to be forward thinking about different ways in which this council uh, can make recommendations to the city on ways in which we can generally improve the health and wellness of, of residents. Um, so it, it's really in that, that latter vein, uh, the idea of, of continuing to just generally be forward thinking in the manner in which we think about health and wellness. It's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Morgan Huey from the College of Charleston, who put together a really wonderful collaborative team to look at uh, bikeability uh, in and around the peninsula area. And uh, Morgan is a, is a very well-respected scientist in the area of physical activity and public health. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome her today. And I'll let her take it from here and introduce the team just in full disclosure. Um, I, I'm a, a member of the team, a minor member of the team, but was very happy to be a part of, of this project. And Morgan, I will, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving us a little bit of time. We're just going to present for about 10 minutes here. I know that you have pressing needs to talk about, but we've had, like Dan said, we've been working as public health professionals, exercise science, and civil and environmental engineering to work together to think about and study how we can make Charleston a more active living city. So we wanted to share some of our results with you today. And we're also sharing our results in less than two weeks with our city planners and representatives from traffic and transportation. Um, so my name is Morgan and just been fortunate to have this multidisciplinary team. We've really been able to work well together and um, have some great discussions and great study across multiple universities in here in South Carolina, as well as um, a faculty member from Georgia Tech. Our work so far has been funded by two transportation research centers. This work from today is um, funded by Clemson's Center for Connected Multimodal Mobility. And we have a continuation project from this work funded by the University of Florida's Stride Center. So I may be preaching to the choir a little bit, but I'm going to preach on for just a moment and recognize that physical inactivity is a major public health issue that we're facing um, really around the globe, but also here in our local um, communities. And so traditionally, when we think about the consequences of physical inactivity, we talk about um, our chronic diseases with heart disease, type two diabetes, and even some cancers. But I also really wanted to link it to our current COVID-19 crisis. And we see that um, physical activity has been recommended particularly for mental health and physical inactivity is a risk factor for the severity of COVID-19. So we really need to promote physical activity for a variety of health issues that we face. Um, and we really need to do that in a lot of different ways. We need to promote physical activity for individuals and communities uh, based on their individual needs. But more and more work, including my research, shows that the communities where we live, work, play, and pray can really shape our behaviors and our overall health and wellness. And particularly the infrastructure in those communities. Can we walk? Can we bike? Can we be in green space in nature? And this infographic on the right is from the Surgeon General's Step It Up walking campaign. Walking is the most common form of physical activity. And it shows all the different places that we may want to promote and try to integrate physical activity into our daily lives and into the lives of our community members. And our research team really cross, cuts across multiple sectors of public health, uh, transportation and land use, individuals and families, as well as parks and recreation. And, and Charleston's really no different. One statistic is that 20% of adults here in Charleston report no leisure time physical activity. 
um, which we would like to see change. And we really, um, I, I put the statistic in the middle to show the percentage of people that use active transportation in our city. So about a little bit less than 6% walk and about 2.5% bike to work. Um, so we really see this as an area that we can increase and improve to improve population physical activity. And that's really linked to our to transportation and how we get around in the city of Charleston. And data from the National Household Transportation Survey shows that 45% of all car trips, so this is to work, to school, to run errands, are three miles or less. And so we really think that if we could capture even a proportion of those and make part of the trip active or make you know just a few of the trips active, we can really move the needle for physical activity here in Charleston and the low country and just make a, a more active city. So one of the ways that we did this, I've been in Charleston um, about four years. And so for four years, we've worked with Gotcha Mobility, which runs Holy Spokes Bike Share. And one of the first ways we collaborated was they really helped when the National Active Living Conference came to Charleston in February of 2018, which our mayor was um, a main speaker at. And they helped us provide bikes, do bike rides. And so our conference attendees could see the city um, on two wheels, which was really great. And from there, we continue to research partnership. And so we have a transportation element of the project. And today we're gonna to talk about um, what we tried to do is take the data that they're collecting on the bike share and estimate this physical activity levels. How active can we be with the, the bike share? So on this slide, the top row are the steps that we took to estimate the specific physical activity of each bike share ride. And on the second row, I provide an example with one specific bike ride of how we did this. So if you haven't ridden the Holy Spokes, um, they're really fun to ride, I recommend it. Um, if you engage the bike and you start your bike ride, every bike has a GPS unit. And so it starts and tracks every single bike ride that's done in the city of Charleston. So using data from that, GPS monitor, we were able to, to estimate the physical activity. Two important variables um, that the GPS monitor captures is the trip distance. So how long was the, was the ride? And that's captured in miles, as well as how long was the ride, the duration, and we measured that in minutes. So for example, one bike share ride was a total of 3.5 miles and it took 30 minutes to complete. So using that data, we collect calculated the average speed of each bike share ride um, in miles per hour. And so this accounts for coming to a stop at stop signs or stoplights and acceleration. And so the average speed in our example um, for that bike ride was seven miles per hour. And so using that seven miles per hour, we assigned a MET value. So a MET stands for a metabolic equivalent. And this is one way we measure how much energy expenditure um, we do during physical activity. So for example, one MET um, represents resting energy expenditure. So the what, how much oxygen we're consuming, how much energy we're expending while resting, while sitting. And another example is 3.5 METs represents a moderate intensity, which is roughly equivalent to a brisk walk. And so we used one other resource called the Compendium of Physical Activities. This is a resource in a, a database that provides estimates for in MET values for a variety of physical activities. So it provides MET values for estimates for things like gardening, walking, and we used biking. Um, so that data has been validated with heart rate monitors and different physical activity monitors. Um, so we took the speed of the bike ride and looked at the corresponding MET value from the compendium of physical activities and assigned that value. We needed one more step. Um, what we really wanted to do was have the number of MET minutes because then we could compare the energy expenditure of the bike ride to national physical activity recommendations, which is just the gold standard. Um, so we multiplied that MET value that in the example, it was 3.5 METs for the seven mile per hour bike ride by the total duration of the ride to calculate MET minutes. 
So in our example, the 30 minute bike ride that was three and a half miles was a, a total of 105 minutes of energy expenditure. The national physical activity recommendations um, are a minimum of 30 minutes of moderate physical activity at least five days per week. And that corresponds to 500 met minutes per week. And you see this range of 500 to 1,000 are recommended, 500 being the minimum. So for that process, we, we use data um, from the entire year of 2018 to do this calculation. Um, and we had about 35,000 bike share trips that we analyzed. We removed outliers of really short trips less than, that were less than one minute in duration or greater than 10 hours, just to not to skew our data too much. And we saw that um, on average, the bike share rides were about two and a half miles for about 40 minutes, um, which was an average speed of a, right at five miles per hour. So really, a, uh, intensity of physical activity. And relating that to the national physical activity recommendations, on average, we calculated each bike share ride was about 160 met minutes. So if we were comparing that to those recommendations, on average, about three bike share rides would help an individual accumulate enough physical activity to meet the weekly physical activity recommendations. You might be thinking that the bike share, do local people use this or is it just people that are visiting our beautiful city? Um, so we had the same question and we had this great data set with our partnership with Gotcha Mobility um, that provided all this data on the bike share rides. So we had very lit limited individual information for privacy purposes, which we completely understood. The only thing that we did have and we used was the membership type that was used to engage the bike. So we talked with staff there and based on the membership type, we were able to classify local users of the bike share and non-local users. So for example, a local user, there are membership types such as annual, MUSC and student memberships. And then non-local were things like a day pass. So someone that's visiting for one day. Um, so we did see pretty big differences, which were not surpri very surprising to us. The local bike share users had shorter trips, but at a much greater speed, so a greater intensity of physical activity. And we really believe that that's representative more of the transportation element of trying to get to point from point A to point B versus maybe a leisurely sh stroll to um, enjoy and see our city. So this is one example. This is one study with um, concrete empirical evidence that active transportation and recreation really can be significant contributors to increasing physical activity levels um, here in Charleston for our for individuals in our community. Um, but if you've walked and biked around Charleston, um, which I do every day down here to CFC, uh, we really need to make biking and walking accessible and safe for everyone. So combining with our the health aspect of the project, this data will be, this is the data that will be presented by my transportation engineering colleagues to our city planners in about a week and a half. Um, we looked at the bike suitability of the street segments here in Charleston. And so they um, classified and ranked all street segments and each one got a grade from A to F on the bike suitability. And so a lot of green, a lot of A and B of local streets that um, people can bike on. But to get to some of the key areas, some of the major employment areas and um, our most popular historic sites, people would have to bike on a street segment that was graded a C, D, or F, um, which is something we would just really like to, to improve and advocate for here in the city of, of Charleston. So we plan to, we're gonna continue to, to work on these um, issues that we see with our multidisciplinary research team, um, strength and partnerships with key stakeholders like yourselves. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces and advocate for action. Ultimately, we wanna see a more active city of Charleston that's safe and walkable and bikeable. 
Um, our next study, we're going to compare bikes and electric assist bikes that Gotcha Mobility is launching in different areas in the U.S. And we would also love to evaluate our new infrastructure that's coming, the Ashley River Bridge crossing. So um, really appreciate your time today. Uh, I don't, we might have a few minutes for questions, but please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Morgan. You know, I'm I'm always struck when I when I see a, a, a picture of the peninsula. It's the shape of a heart, and uh, we want that heart to be as vibrant and strong as possible. And and so, um, just a brief commentary there. But let me let me open it up to the group and see if there are any questions for Dr. Huey with respect to this particular study, or just general questions maybe about bikeability, walkability and some of the issues that we've been discussing over time. Uh, Dan, this is Susan Johnson. Uh, Morgan, it's great to see you. Um, always love hearing about your work. Um, I have one quick question about um, collaborations. Did you, um, by chance, I know you said you were presenting, I think, to the planning group at the city. Um, have you been collaborating with um, Charleston Moves? Because I know they have a lot of data as well. Yeah, we, we touch base as a research team with them about once a quarter, just to kind of share updates and where we're at. And they also recommended that we maybe do a, a similar, very brief presentation to the bike pet advisory committee. Um, but yeah, we're in, we're in communication with them and how, maybe how they can use our, our empirical data for advocacy as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Morgan, this is uh, Joey Current. Um, my question is, um, as you've done this research and you prepare to present, um, what do you anticipate are the biggest barriers uh, in the city of Charleston to, um, to having more bikeable uh, and, and bike friendly streets? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have learned a lot being here in Charleston and I know that there are some great plans in place, like the people pedal plan. And I know that this is a, a big part of um, the 10 year comprehensive plan that's coming up. And, and it was great to hear from city employees. They want to see this work. And of course we've agreed to share our data and integrate that. Um, I think it's really just putting those plans in place. And, and we hope to be able just to provide empirical evidence for maybe some priority areas that we see as um, maybe that have the most issues or maybe ranked the lowest in our bike suitability index for action. So I think there's a lot of um, people that agree and want to take action to make more biking and walking friendly. And so it's just it, taking those steps. So thank you, Dr. Huey, for um, this work. It will help push our efforts along and you're right. There are great plans in place and we just need to uh, push along and get some more of them accomplished. And, and unfortunately, uh, Joey, that often comes down to funding and also jurisdictional bureaucracy because 80% of the streets are DOT streets and only 20% are city. So we always have uh, um, you know issues with getting permission to do things that we would like to do. But, um, and, but funding is the other, um, I guess, biggest obstacle because I, I think we all share a, a, a vision of um, making Charleston more bikeable, walkable, and um, and healthier by, by, by way. But this helps push us along. So thank you for the work and the research. Thank you. And let me let me uh, thank you, Mayor, for, for bringing that up. And I know economics is always one of the big challenges. And uh, I, let me, uh, Jeff Davis, Dr. Davis from our civil engineering department has also been involved in this research and uh, he and I have collaborated on some different things and one of them being trying to estimate, you know, the economic impact uh, of, of bikeability and walkability and, and Jeff, I was wondering if you wanted to, if you wanted to make, maybe make a brief comment about some of the, some of the work that we've done and, and can continue to do to demonstrate the economic value associated with this. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks so much for letting us present some of our research today. I think, you know, it's an it's a overlapping area now between transportation, physical activity, and public health, and, uh, 
and there's a new paradigm in how we think about mobility and all, all that we want mobility to provide for our community. So, you know, making decisions to, to uh, truly embrace multi-mobility uh, and, and, and being able to accommodate short trips outside of personal vehicles, these, these are, have tangible benefits. And, uh, and I think, you know, like the more that we get a chance to kind of engage with uh, the local jurisdictions and, and with decision makers, uh, then I think the more we, we improve that dialogue. So this is a big goal of our research. Uh, the focus, with these, these were federally funded research grants and a big aspect is placed on technology transfer. So we're not doing them just to get publications, we're doing them to make our communities better. And, and I, I know speaking for our team, we love Charleston and, and we love doing the work here and hope that it makes it can make a difference. Yeah, th thank you, Jeff. And uh, if there aren't any other questions uh, from the group, I'll give one one chance, one last chance to ask a, a question. Otherwise, we'll we'll move on. Okay. Well, uh, to Morgan and and the team that did this work, thanks so much uh, for your efforts, not only in this research but uh, but to come and present to us today. And uh, these are topics that are very much related to things we'll be discussing a little bit later on in the agenda. Things like health and all policies and health equity. So, uh, so this this will resonate uh, through the rest of our meeting. So, th thanks so much for taking time today, and um, and we'll 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 be in touch. Okay, and with that, um, I'd like to move on to the next item in the agenda, which is our our uh, shifting from being really forward thinking. Uh, to thinking about some of our immediate challenges, which is obviously COVID-19 is our most significant immediate challenge. So I wanted to ask Tracy McKee if, um, for an update on uh, for the Charleston area. Tracy. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And just uh, really quickly, um, as an avid runner and cyclist and former board member of Charleston News. I'm really glad to be here today to see uh, Dr. Huey and the team, their work and, and hear their presentation. So thanks for, for all that you guys are doing. Um, it's great stuff. Um, so I think everybody is well aware that um, at least at the county level, our numbers are good and that's, that's very much the same um, at the Charleston city zip code level. Um, we've continued to, to see really good numbers from um, both the new cases per thousand, which really gives us an indicator of our hospital's um, capability to, to, to handle patients as well as ability to do good contact tracing. Um, the transmission rate or growth, growth rate has, has really just been very, very low. Um, kind of the one outlier that we have is the... Um, positivity rate. Um, Charleston County over the last 14 days is still kind of at 7%. We seem to be, be hovering there. Um, so, um, so with that, we, we've been here for a while. We've seen good numbers. Um, and so part of our um, you know, phased reopening plan was to basically use this data to help dictate or help us determine when we can loosen the faucet just a little bit. Um, and so we've decided that we would, we are gonna move into phase three and have been making preparations for that over the next few weeks. And it's a four phased approach. So, so phase four, it kind of gets us to, to what we've kind of called our new normal. Um, with, phase, with phase three, I think kind of the biggest, the biggest change, if you will, is um, our, our offices are open to the public. But when I say that, um, we, I want to be clear that we are encouraging our citizens to, to continue to do business with us digitally. Um, you know, continue to have phone and video conference meetings instead of in-person meetings. Um, when in-person meetings are absolutely necessary, 
Um, we are obviously using masks. Um, that's a requirement, social distancing. We're also asking everyone to limit that in-person time to less than 15 minutes. So do everything possible over the phone and through video as much as possible. And we're also encouraging people to make appointments so that we don't have um, influx of people. Um, so we're so those are the things that we are really working on in the city this week. Um, of course, we are not afraid to dial it back. If our numbers do start to start to change, we know we know how to do that. We know what to do, um, and so we are not afraid to do that. I think the biggest thing for me, and I think for our team, is is right now. I think everyone's aware we're seeing some um, increase in cases in Europe as well as New York City, some places that had things very much under control. Um, so I'm really interested, you know, to hear from Dr. Richardson and other medical professionals today about, you know, um, what what do we do as a city to make sure that we don't fall into the same traps that they've done as our weather starts to turn colder? Because right now, we we as a state even look really good when we look at COVID cases across the nation. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we make sure we hold the line and continue to do a really good job of limiting the transmission of COVID? within our community. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have about, about what we're doing internally and, and our city numbers as well. Tracy, let, let me first just give my thanks to, to you and the group and, and particularly the city for uh, continuing to, to make data-driven decisions uh, and, and to follow those quite closely as we as we take this phased approach, knowing, knowing that we need to proceed with caution, uh, but that we're always using the data to drive the decision, which I think uh, is, is quite commendable. Um, and if there are some questions for Tracy, let's go ahead and, and have those uh, taken now. Uh, otherwise we can move into an update from uh, uh, Katie Richardson and, and maybe Robert Ball as they relate to, uh, to DHEC and an overall medical update. Any questions for Tracy before we move forward? And truly, I just wanna say, I mean, the mayor gets, you know, 100% credit for, for you know, his leadership and making sure that, you know, that we are following the data and using data to drive our decision-making, so. Thank you for your leadership, Mayor. Thank you, I see Council Member Sheely has Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Tracy, thank you for your reports and all that you do with this. You know that I look at this pretty much daily because when it went wacko the other day, I, I, I got you. But I wanted to just check. This may be more of a Dr. Richardson question. I'm not sure. Just wondering how important that 7% positivity rate is, because in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, if we had more well people go and take this thing, then we'd be at this 5% that's this magical number that puts us in the green. And I'm, I'm just curious, and as, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, as we move into the colder weather and people start having non-COVID illnesses, colds and things like that, we're going to have more positive um, results on that. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how important that 7% and why 5% is this magical percentage that puts us in the green, I guess. <laughs> I'm definitely going to defer to Dr. Richardson on that question. Thanks for that question. It's a great one. Um, and as always, these sort of metrics, there's no magic number, right? Like 5% and 7% are fairly close, but the lower it is, the better. Um, we're going to be off. And that's why one of the things I want to really emphasize today, to Tracy's point about what more can the city and the state be doing, um, is we are putting um, additional emphasis on the need for testing now. Um, for a long time, and many of you on this call know well, it was very difficult to get a test. Um, and, um, and so that access was not there. We believe now that uh, along with uh, many of the partners on this call, uh, we've been able to improve that access greatly, particularly in this Charleston area of our state. And so not only are we continuing to recommend the diagnostic testing for two groups, anyone with symptoms, 
And those include, you know, our, our normal cold symptoms or allergy symptoms. Uh, so we're really trying to encourage those, even with very mild symptoms, um, to seek out testing. Um, in addition, as we uh, have been emphasizing for close contacts, those who are identified as a close contact, um, 15 minutes or more within six feet of a known positive uh, case, we're also recommending around day seven after that exposure to seek testing, even if there are no symptoms and prior to that, if any symptoms develop. So that's sort of um, where we have been, but we want to keep emphasizing those two um, those two sort of diagnostic categories, but we're now um, increasingly emphasizing what we call screening testing. And so that's for those of us who are out in the community, um, even if we're practicing precautions, but we're regularly around the public, we are now recommending testing at least once a month. And for those of us who are around um, others because we cannot or do not wear a mask or um, socially distance, we're recommending more frequent testing to that. Um, and again, DHEC has um, uh, what I hope is a very user-friendly um, web page for testing locations, saying which are free, which require um, an appointment. You know, you can put, I just want testing locations today. Um, we also, um, have our static testing locations of which MUSC, Roper St. Francis and FEDER um, all on this call do, uh, do have available on a daily basis. And so I believe that that percent positivity rate and the way that we're gonna get it um, to go down further is to really encourage testing for all of those uh, categories. So thanks so much for that question. It allowed me to to, uh, to make those points and, uh, and I'm happy to take any other questions. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll add a little bit to what Mr. Sheely said. You know, I, I think that, it, that the percent positivity rate can be confusing for folks sometimes, especially as we think about it. It's a percentage, right? So the more people getting tested, less people getting tested, it will affect that percentage. Uh, is there any thought towards moving the metric to an incidence rate? Uh, that we want to get below maybe a two week cumulative incidence rate instead of relying on that percentage of positive tests? Um, so I don't know if that question is for Tracy or for me, but we do actually look at both of those. So we, uh, we put out a, we call it a school metrics um, report once a week. Um, it's really metrics that can be used by anyone, but it can be found in the county level data on our school's webpage. It looks at two week incidence rate by county. It looks at the trend in that incidence rate. So comparing the current two weeks to the two weeks prior to um, those. So it's sort of the second two weeks of September to the first two weeks of September. And it looks at percent positivity rate. And then it provides an average um, of those three as sort of you know one um, measure of, um, you know, of, um, you know, whether it's low, medium, or high um, risk. Tracy addressed that for the city. Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely are using um, a combination of metrics as well. We're not, I mean, the percent positivity is a piece of the puzzle, of course. Um, and we felt like, you know, after talking to you know some our friends in the medical community that um, that the metrics the other metrics we're tracking are so low and the transmission rate is so low um, that we that's why we made the decision we felt comfortable kind of loosening the faucet a little bit if you will. Thank you, Joey, for that question. I think we're all uh, becoming students of public health, and and just to clarify for those who may be tuning in. Uh, from outside the group or those maybe inside the group. So incidence uh, in, in public health speak is a measure of the total number of new cases uh, of, of a disease or an outcome. And the incidence rate is just the number of those new cases divided by uh, a certain number in the population, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, whatever it may be. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that point uh, before we move on. But Joey, thanks for that question. I think that's a really important question. Um, any other questions specifically for Tracy before we maybe move officially over to uh, 
to Katie for a, for a DHEC medical update. Okay, hearing none, uh, Katie, we'll, we'll officially then uh, toss the ball to you and ask for uh, just a low country DHEC medical update. Thank you, Dan. Um, I know we have a full agenda, so I don't want to take too much um, time today. But in addition to the testing, I just wanted to mention a few other um, sort of initiatives around um, COVID. Um, the first one is related to COVID, but is actually the flu. And I want to thank the mayor. I saw on Facebook him uh, getting his flu vaccine. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, a great, you know, quote about the importance of flu vaccines this year about getting getting them early. Um, and so I really want to thank you for that, um, Mayor, and just emphasize that um, all years we believe flu vaccine is important, but particularly this year, both because it can complicate the picture of whether this might be COVID or not, but there's a lot of similarities in the, in the symptoms. And also we don't want to overburden our healthcare um, uh, organizations. And we, we're certainly seeing that now in North Dakota and some other states as well as um, other countries. And so while our numbers do look good, and I, I don't want to be a pessimist, um, I also don't want us to let down our guard at this time when we know that hospitalization rates generally um, rise in uh, fall and winter. So we don't want to overburden when we have a vaccine that can definitely help to keep um, those who potentially are at risk um, um, for flu out of, um, out of the hospital. In addition to that, we continue to plan for a COVID vaccine. We do not have a date that that vaccine will be available, but we are working on a, um, a plan that will provide that vaccine um, to those in our state in a safe and equitable um, way. We will be presenting that plan to the CDC in mid-October um, and hope to you know, have it firmly in place by the time that um, the vaccine does start coming uh, to South Carolina. We're also working on updating recommendations to address the CDC acknowledgement of airborne aerosol uh, spread um, of COVID. And um, so we should be seeing that um, in the coming days. We continue to work with schools on guidance. Um, we certainly want to keep our um, kids in school uh, learning face-to-face -face, um, as much as possible. And I think Charleston County School District is doing a wonderful job in, uh, in making that happen. Um, and I, uh, so we'll continue to see more guidance come out about that. We've worked with them and we'll continue to work with them closely. And then I just wanted to mention that we're also beginning to not even beginning, but we're getting closer to having saliva testing um, available. Um, not as widespread as we would want to be um, quickly, but uh, are beginning to um, figure out how to, uh, that will increase access. It could be, um, it's sort of self-administered, so it decreases the risk uh, to our uh, healthcare personnel, allows people to um, collect uh, outside of healthcare um, facilities. And we've certainly seen it employed at the University of South Carolina and, um, and want to assist. And uh, DHEC and, uh, you know, all of it comes back to, you know, from the very beginning, it's the same messaging. Um, that we have, uh, have been providing from the beginning, which is the social distancing, the mask, um, the hand hygiene, and, um, and now getting your flu shot um, are all sort of the continued uh, preventive messages. And, and we'll be here, I think, even after the vaccine uh, begins to come to South Carolina um, for months uh, more. So thanks for having me. And I um, am happy to take any further questions um, that anyone may have. Uh, we, <clears throat> Katie, thanks, thanks again to, to you and, and the entire DHEC team for all that you're continuing to do to help surveil the situation and keep us abreast of what's happening. I, I do have one question uh, about uh, about the you know some of the messaging that's happening. You know, you mentioned uh, in, in your previous uh, uh, brief here that that the the protocols for testing are evolving and changing, uh, and that the recommendations for testing 
uh, are, are, are to now, the, the, since the availability has increased, uh, you're, you're making recommendations for more frequent testing. Uh, and my question was just uh, about how, how what, what the plans are maybe to, to message that out to the public uh, and if there are any challenges or barriers that you face with getting that message out to the public. Um, that is a great question. And I'm not sure I um, have my finger on the pulse of exactly what sort of the outreach group is doing to, uh, to message that. Certainly, um, we're getting the message to talk about it at you know, meetings like this and other um, venues that we have to, uh, to speak to the public directly um, about it. Uh, but other than that, I, I think we, um, we still have work to do <laughs> to, to, to get that um, to get that message out. And so um, I know that they're thinking about it and, and working on it, but I don't know exactly um, sort of what, what the plans are for doing that. Okay. And, and I guess a follow up either question or point to make is a question is, is there something this, that this group can do? You may not have an answer to that question right now, uh, but, but if there is, I, I hope that you would let us know so that we can try to help disseminate, deliver that message in, as broadly as possible. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. If the, I assume that there will be PSAs or other announcements that are um, are developed for this, and I will definitely share those um, with this group. Um, in the meantime, really, a, the ask is just to continue to spread it to your contacts and um, those that that you come in, uh, you know, those that you're able to influence in the community. Um, I know that we've gotten involved. I think um, Paul put us in touch with um, those that write the newsletter for the city of, um, of Charleston. And so that's certainly an avenue. Um, I'll work with our um, regional sort of outreach coordinator, Evelyn Fernandez, um, to see if we can sort of um, formulate some messaging that, that might be able to go out um, in that form. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, let, let me take a moment here again to pause and see if there are any questions or comments uh, based on Dr. Richardson's uh, presentation before we move on to the next item, health in all policies. Mayor Tecklenburg. So, yes, Mr. Mayor. Th thank you, Dan. And this might be more of a comment and challenge than a question. But um, thank you, Katie, for all you're doing and, and for uh, recognition of me getting a shot. And it wasn't just about um, you know, the, the thought of there being a uh, twin demic, you know, with flu and COVID at the same time. But, but really, I, I want to try to set the stage for the massive job that you're preparing for, as you mentioned, of, of distributing fairly and uh, getting it out there when we do get the COVID vaccine. So um, I, I would consider it kind of a challenge for all of us to, to get um, the flu vaccine out as widely as possible, particularly those who are underserved in our community. They will probably be the hardest to reach when we get the uh, COVID vaccine. Um, of course, the, the main responsibility lies with you healthcare professionals and DHEC when, when that gets done. The city's willing to help with facilities and however else we can. I saw on our agenda for next week that we're have a grant to buy this trailer that we're going to be able to uh, move around and, and provide another resource through our fire department to, to have vaccine uh, mobility, so to speak. But um, I, I, I think the more we can do to just get people in, in, a, in a habit, if you will, of, of having a vaccine and, and knowing where it's available and, and uh, making it widely available would be uh, a wise thing for us to do over the next uh, couple of months. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other any other comments before or questions before we move on? We've got about twelve minutes before we need to wrap up. Mark, this is Mark yeah. Mark Dixon with Roper St. Francis Healthcare. I want to first commend Mayor Tecklenburg and the Charleston area for really getting this right and staying vigilant on all these issues. Question is about the schools. This might be anecdotal, but what I've heard is other school areas of the South, other states, where they have opened earlier um, than we did, they have not seen, this, this might be a good news part of it, that they have not seen the spikes anticipated. Is that true? And do we maybe have some silver linings here that, that there won't be the outbreaks that might have been expected? 
Um, that's what I've heard generally. I'm, you know, I'm sure there's, there is the outlier that uh, we've certainly heard of a few clusters here and there, but I think that has generally um, been true. And I think that, you know, it's certainly the case in the low country, which I know most about, is that even those districts that have opened earlier um, have really done a good job. There have been cases, and we know there are going to be cases because there's still widespread transmission in our communities, but schools have done a good job in preventing further transmission um, within that, um, that setting. Dr. Ball, I thought he might know too. <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, Mark. Um, uh, Katie's right. In general, uh, the curve has remained flat for the last month or so, but is tending upwards in certain hot spots. Uh, one thing of note uh, for those of you who uh, go onto the CDC website, the last few weeks have had some MMWRs come out showing that uh, teenagers and young people catch and spread the virus as readily as adults. Now they don't get the complications that older folks do, but uh, they're spreaders and sometimes they're super spreaders. There was one teenager who super spread it to a family gathering. So as we will trickle upwards, of course, as schools uh, resume more closer uh, uh, contact, but what we fear more, though, are going to be mass uh, congregations, the crowds, clusters of people, um, voting, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, particularly Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we won't have vaccines. We talk about a vaccine. There will probably be several that will come out, but they will come out in aliquots or portions of um, 100,000 here, 500,000 there. Healthcare workers are in tier 1A, uh, and that probably won't occur before or until Christmas. So what we are looking at the next few months of continued upward uh, trends. And uh, the, the good news is that mask is social distancing or physical distancing um, will help keep the flu numbers down and the COVID numbers down. The downside is that there are still uh, uh, huge numbers of people in the country who don't believe in uh, social distancing, mask, uh, vaccines, et cetera. And uh, they are going to be the hardest to reach. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other thoughts, comments before we move on to our health and all policies discussion? Okay, well, th thanks again, you know, Katie and, and all and, and uh, Tracy for all the work that you're continue, continuing to do to help us in this uh, most current uh, public health crisis. Um, thinking forward again, as I mentioned earlier on in the meeting where we sort of, we we're gonna go back and forth between uh, immediate needs and, and needs going forward. Um, we have discussed in the past and uh, Paul was kind enough to attach and send along a number of examples of health in all policies. And essentially what this means is that as uh, policymakers are considering policy and action across almost anything, whether that's transportation or law enforcement or uh, city codes, all, all types of different things, um, there should be a lens uh, of health and that health is a cross cutting issue uh, and that it's something that we would want our local policymakers to consider as they're making their policy decisions, that health be an element to that. And we, as a, as a, as a uh, health and wellness committee, uh, wanted to put forward the idea that, that that would be a good thing to do, to, to have a health and all policies policy. Um, so Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce it back over to you uh, for some commentary here. And, and I think our our objective is, is actually to get a motion uh, put forward uh, before we convene today. Thanks, Dan. And I, I will tell you, I'm wearing a mask because I was fortunate that my intern, who's like a ghost behind me, Claire uh, Cicerello is joining us. And um, I, we're socially distanced, um, but I wanted to make sure I was wearing my mask. So excuse me for, for having that on. 
I'm going to ask Susan, since Susan really introduced us to health and all policies, and I pulled up one of the two handouts that gave it, and Susan, I do have the, um, the PowerPoint on the other one if you need it, so um, however you want to deal with it, you have access to that. Um, thanks, Paul, and thanks for putting this on the agenda and bringing it back to the forefront. I know we've been kind of sidetracked and, and dealing with COVID, but um, if y'all recall, I think it was in the spring, really right before everything shut down, we had started to move forward with, um, you know, with this group and, and looking at uh, bringing some folks um, some experts um, from the CDC, from the city of St. Pete who have done this um, and done it well um, to provide us with some, I think it was you know, maybe a workshop um, so that we could understand, um, really um, understand how, why it's important and how to go about it. And unfortunately, um, all of that got um, kind of put on the side um, on the back burner, but we, we do believe it's really important. And just even today in this meeting, you know, hearing from our um, researchers at our higher ed institutions within our own community, we have an amazing um, group of folks who could really support us in this effort. So it's not something that I think that this committee would need to take on solely. Um, the other thing that really has, um, come to my attention over the past couple meetings is the importance of us having some line of communication to the other committees. So if you recall earlier in the uh, summer, we were kind of bouncing back and forth with the traffic transportation and the pedestrian bike pedestrian committees and trying to make some links there around the, um, you know, opening up some of the streets. And I think there is just really an opportunity for us to collaborate um, within the committees uh, that represent the city of Charleston, as well as all of the different um, departments that are making decisions that we would want to have some input. So I think that was another conversation that we had early on is how do we um, create some type of process so that we as a committee and other committees can be informed about things that are coming up on the city council agenda or across the mayor's desk that we could um, provide input and support to. So um, those are just some things that I wanted to, to highlight. And then I think, you know, in terms of next steps, I think we all agree that this is something that is very important and that it should probably come from this committee. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure if maybe a city task force would be a good uh, way to start to move this forward so that we could then collaborate outside of our committee um, with, um, like I say, some of the folks in higher ed that are doing research in this area that could provide some support, as well as um, community stakeholders and folks within the city government um, that uh, um, have an interest or that, that just makes sense. Um, so I wanted to see if that is something that this group thinks is um, a way to start to move this forward. And certainly we would want to um, have, a, have a strong presence if, the, if we did agree that a, a task force was um, a way to start to move this forward. Um, we would certainly want to have representation. I think if, if not, then we would need to at least have a subgroup, a subcommittee or a work group um, with representation, with, you know, with, with this group to start to work on this, because um, it's something that needs to happen outside of our, our monthly meetings. Thank, thank you for that, Susan. I, I, I think that that is a logical step that we would take. Um, and I, I guess a question I have for Paul and the group is, is, is that, you know, having that kind of group established is that the next logical step again if we're going to make a motion here uh, or, or is there a step before that that we need to take to simply make a recommendation to city council uh, that they adopt a health and all policies approach then that that, that that maybe lays the foundation for establishing that group i'm just posing that question uh, in an effort to hopefully get a, a motion on the table that we can vote on as a group today Paul, any thoughts there or anyone else? 
Well, I, I see Councilmember Sheely on, and I, I, I don't know if he wants to add in, but I, my thoughts is that while we're in this 10-year planning, it's a great opportunity to at least send it to our planning commission to take a, our planning department to at least take a look at it to see how in their plans they could figure out does it have a path system currently that they are already working on that it could be incorporated because we have so many different people working on health in our community and are in this plan but my first thought was we get it in front of them to take a good look at it to see what kind of fit it would have but mayor kevin i i, I really asked y'all for what your thoughts would be yeah, I agree with you, Paul. I mean, put it in front of the planning department, having them take a look at it, make sure it's in the plans. Um, I, I totally agree with that. I think that's a good next step. Yeah, and, and we can always put that invite that we're willing to step to the table to help out in every direction. And Susan, I think the training that you've already started us on discussing and the different experts we've got in our community, we have the resources. So, new committee that's the commission on social injustice and um racial um recon or reconciliation i think it is but the um those committees will all be interested because what they're talking about is sort of the, the same thing here it's how do we look at look at health disparities in our communities and then through the policy making how do we really look at how we're going to move that needle it's, Really, the mayor's one really started all of our discussions when we started looking at the the life expectancy issues that were going on. So, just just wanted to get it out there because it's a shame for it to sit on our 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 desk right now. Mr. Mayor, so if I could weigh in, I I love the the concept health and all policies, um, and I think it would be appropriate for this um, committee to report this up to city council. Uh, for their um, endorsement. Um, it's, it's really a, a unique time with all the planning that we have going on right now <clears throat> with our update of our comprehensive plan. So um, frankly, I don't know why we would, I mean, you, you mentioned bringing this planning department. I, I think you formally bring this to the comprehensive planning update and uh, that way it gets embedded long in our long-term uh, comprehensive plan. Um, I, I, I must say just from a, a logistics point of view with all the other task force and commissions and everything that um, we've got going on, I, I would respectfully suggest that we keep any new group under, under this health and wellness um, committee. Um, not that you couldn't invite non-committee members to serve on a subcommittee of this group, but just from an organizational point, uh, in my mind, that would, that would be, that would be um, efficient and would always allow the recommendations of uh, any further group to, to, to come through health and wellness. Um, but anyway, um, that can be worked out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that for that feedback. So I'm 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 trying to craft here. I know we're up. We're already two minutes over. Um, so Paul, I don't, I don't know if you have uh, written down a, a particular uh, uh, motion that you'd like to put forward. If not, I'd be happy to try to wordsmith one here uh, pretty quickly, and and maybe it's one that we can uh, have discussion on and vote on. Would you I like? Yield to, oh, I, yield, to go? I yield to the interim chair. Okay. Um, so I, I would like to make a motion uh, that uh, the, the planning committee uh, for the 10 year plan consider a health in all policies approach as they're developing and implementing the plan. And that in so doing, they consult with the mayor's health and wellness committee and other relevant committees as they take this health in all policies approach. So that's that's the motion. Is there a second? Second it, Dan. Okay, I have a second. Thank you, Mark. And any discussion? Can, can you just uh, amend that to add that we'd also present this to city council as well? No. Yes. And yeah. that this recommendation would be presented to city council. We will add that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other discussion? 
Uh, I'd like to I'd like to add that you know this this type of uh, work is is fully supported by by um, healthy tri or healthy tri county uh, and also um, you know there are a couple of different ways that health and all policies can can play out as it's being implemented in a in a municipal setting so uh, sometimes people are uh, can go about it in a very opportunistic way like like it seems like we're looking at it we're looking at looking at uh, this planning process and inserting a health and all policies approach to rolling it out. Um, other uh, other cities will, will look at this from a uh, more like sector based approach. They might pick a particular sector like transportation or something that's got momentum uh, or is of a particular interest and really focus in on that. Um, and so, it, you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be important for us as we move forward to kind of think about how how this would work. And ultimately, the goal is to have, you know, a, a proclamation that we are taking a health and all policies approach to policymaking across the board, um, which which really lays the foundation for things in the future. Um, and as it pertains to kind of looking at a city plan, uh, I'll add that there are a lot of resources um, out there. Uh, which which allows folks to take like a cross matrix of each section of the city plan and ask some really pertinent questions like is there health language uh, inserted in part of you know this section uh, are there are there particular things because we are not reinventing the wheel here you know lots of cities like we've seen with St. Pete and others uh, have had lots of uh, really great success implementing this and so um, uh, you know very excited for this to move forward happy to be on any um, group or, or sub subgroup that takes this on. Thank you, Joey, and, and thank you for potentially volunteering in advance. I was gonna I was gonna volunteer you anyway. Uh, that, so th thanks that, for doing that. Any, that any sounded other? Like more than potentially volunteering. I, yeah, you're you're nominated. Are, are there any other uh, considerations or discussion before we uh, move this to a vote? All right, hearing none, I'll ask you to all unmute uh, your microphones, please. So all those in favor of <clears throat> put, putting forward a recommendation from this committee for a health in all policies approach uh, to be considered uh, by the planning committee and city council say aye. 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 And all those opposed, can you please say aye. Okay, thank you. It's very clear that that uh, motion is approved unanimously. So thank you to everybody for that. I think that is a very nice step forward. Um, again, as we shift from uh, immediate thinking to long term thinking, that is a really important step forward. Uh, I, I recognize that we are now seven minutes uh, past our uh, time. So I will uh, I, I guess defer back to Paul. Paul, is, is, is there a way for us to, well, first of all, I want to give anybody who really needs to jump off the opportunity to do so now, uh, and then defer back to Paul as to whether or not uh, we can table the health disparities special meeting date uh, and or general community update to our next meeting, or do we need to cover those today? Well, I'll be real quick to cover the special disparities. Anton would like to set a meeting in the next couple of weeks, early November, the latest, that is not just the more topics, it's only one topic on it and health disparities. And so he would like to call a special committee meeting for that, but I just don't have the date on that. That's all I just wanted to pour it out. But okay. he would like to have one and invite other groups to listen in on it. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and finally, any, any general community update before we convene? No, our community is so thankful for our health professionals, for Katie and Dr. Ball and, and for the whole group that just pulls together to really make a difference for us. So thank you. And thanks for our leadership and our mayor. Thank you all. Appreciate yep. your service. Thank you, everybody. Mo motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Be well. Bye-bye.